if you have not read the story yet, this is the story that was published toward the end of last year uh, in which uh, Stephanie was able to chat with a collection of women from across the country who shared uh, their experiences about working in beer and kind of the hazards uh, that come with it as well. Um, it was a very uh, challenging at times story uh, to read uh, and uh, I imagine work on. Um, Stephanie, I, I certainly appreciate the effort that you put in to bring this story to life. Uh, let's start with square one. Uh, if you want to give a little background about why it was you wanted to tell this story in the first place. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, thanks for having me uh, back. Appreciate being here. Um, so this story came to me. Um, I took a trip to Montana, which every time I say that now, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> we used to go places. <laughs> um, so I took a trip to Montana and there I met Amanda Oates, um, who I believe is one of the first women mentioned in the article. Um, and she had told me, or actually I got her contact information and after I came back to Atlanta, um, I just sat down and talked to her. I didn't have an agenda, just wanted to see what story she had and she shared the story about um, doing a tap takeover um, at a bar. Um, she's a sales rep, by the way. And she it was a small town and a, one of the guys at the bar followed her back to her hotel room. She's not quite sure if he followed her or um, like directly or he is a small town. There aren't many hotel options. Um, and she said that she told he told the woman at the desk um, that he was her husband and he got a key card to get into her room and she had the door latched. So when he did open the door, he wasn't able to get in. And the way she even told this story, it was just kind of like, you know, I went down to the store, got eggs and I dropped them on the floor. Like it was just like, and I was listening to this and like, you know, like, it, the story just stayed with me. Um, I mean, I think it will forever stay with me because of how, like, how frightening is that? Um, and so when the call for the diversity grant came out, I, I went ahead and submitted that because I figured, you know, there are tons of women who probably have the same story and this is a subject that needs to be talked about. Um, and so that's how I ended up writing about it. Yeah, I want to highlight, I'm going to sh share my screen briefly again. Um, one of the challenging things about this story is every woman has a line like what you see or hear highlighted. One lesson I learned from that one situation is I never want to, it to happen again. So now when I check into a hotel room, I either will hand a hand write a note or verbally let someone know that I'm traveling alone. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And to have versions of that anecdote told multiple times, of which we will, uh, I want to ask you about too. Um, the way that you're telling the story that is, so when you're chatting with Amanda, this is not, you know, necessarily a story that you had in mind so much. It was just a conversation that you learned about this. How do you take something like that where it is this kind of uh, very serious, very intense story but then start thinking about it of ways that you wanted to turn it into that pitch, that this is an anchor of something that needs to be talked about and written about. How does it go from hearing about this in conversation to then thinking about it in more journalistic way? Mm. Um, I, I feel like with this one, I put, I first put the call out about um, I like I had some general ideas of what I wanted to do is like tell these stories and then also provide some advice for like how brewery owners could fix the situation for women or make it safer for women and um, it it I mean Brian you really helped me a lot with it with this because I there were some parts of it where I didn't really well, I'll say this. I felt like I had heard these stories before. Um, they weren't stories where I was, I mean, of course I was shocked because these are terrible things, but 
I mean, if you talk to your girlfriends, they've been harassed by men. Like th this isn't anything new, I think, for a woman. But when Brian was reading and editing, he was like, whoa, what's going on here? And he like really brought to my attention um, the fact that these the burden is being put on women to fix this issue and not really put on, it should be put on men to behave better. And so with his guidance, I was able to take the story there. Um, but just in general, like I listened to the women and then started finding a common theme and, and started shifting and crafting the story that way. Um, but like I said, with Brian's help, I was really able to, I think, feel like put the cherry on top of the story um, for lack of a better term. Uh, I, as editor, I don't take credit. Uh, Stephanie, you did a great job and it is the, your words there. So uh, thank you for those kind words. Um, but I, I think what you're saying there ties back to the conversation that we had this past weekend with Lily Waite and Holly Regan. Um, when we're talking about kind of the challenges of reporting on uh, when it comes to stories related to diversity and inclusion and a growing beer consumer base and kind of the way that you tell a story that isn't belittling of the voices that you want to bring forward in the case of Lily and Holly they were talking about um, LGBTQI plus uh, and the way that you know just to have them be people that you don't want to take away from their voices but also try to keep it in terms of where you don't lose the kind of narrative journalistic flow of things. Mm -hmm. Now I know in the in the back and forth you and I have this background and the, the kind of way it came to be in terms of the collection of vignettes and how that kind of helped shape the story but for those of us because I think covering these topics are becoming uh, more common thankfully mm -hmm. that we're finding ways to tell these stories and find voices in new ways could you maybe, for those who, who have or even haven't written stories like this before, what it was like in terms of trying to, um, I guess, maintain the voice of these women and make sure that you could tell their stories in what effectively is kind of like a short and contained way? What was the challenge or how did you approach that? Yeah, so um, making sure that each woman had, I mean, it's, sifting through all of the information they've provided and finding like one or two quotes that really encompasses um, the story that I'm trying to tell, but then also like respects the information that they've told me. So, um, because there's so many great things that these women touched on, but um, in order to give each one of them a a highlight in the article and and tell the overall story. It's really um, identifying like that one line, those one or two lines that really speak to the entire story and and somehow relate to what the other women were saying. So, um, I mean, I I think like one of the best ways that I found to do that, which might not be there, might be a better way, but just kind of letting all of the information spill out onto the page and then just trying to edit it down until you have something that's cohesive. How did you find these women? Let's go back to maybe toward mm. the reporting. Yeah, and that actually was pretty difficult. Um, one, because it's a tough topic. Um, not a lot of people, not a lot of women feel comfortable talking about these things and one of the things that I've discovered in my research of this article is that like, retaliation is oh, gosh I want to remember the exact stat but um, it's a significant portion of the complaints when it comes to um, harassment sexual harassment and oh um, no I thought I saw it but I didn't um, so a lot of women don't want to talk about it because they're afraid of losing their jobs. Um, or they're uncomfortable with talking about this subject altogether. It's, it's difficult to talk to someone who you don't know about something that happened to you, which still has is a tough, touchy subject. Um, so what I did was um, 
I put a call out on, I mean, social media is great for this. Uh, put a call out on Twitter and um, there's a few uh, groups that I'm a part of on Facebook. I put a call out there. Um, and I had a few women who contacted me and they, they were like, yeah, I would love to talk about this, but I just don't feel comfortable doing so. And some people, we scheduled uh, interviews and they decided not to come forward after all. And um, I've heard of women, there are groups where women, that's all they do is, I mean, not all they do, but they talk about these things, but they, it, it's just, it's such a touchy subject. And the, I mean, the women who came forward, I applaud them for doing so, but uh, it's hard and you never want to pressure anyone to talk into you just for your story. Um, so you just have to like, you have to respect their, um, where they are in that moment. And, um, and just, I don't know, just believe that you're going to be able to talk to someone if you're trying to tell this story, which I was able to, you know, get a few people. The only, the only thing I wish I would have been able to get is more diverse voices. But, um, again, uh, if you want to talk about intersexuality, like how many Black women are in this industry are uh, Indigenous women, uh, Asian women, and uh, you take that amount and then have them talk about this topic. It's just difficult. Um, so that would be the only, well, I, I can't necessarily change it. I put the call out, but um, yeah, you just have to be patient. Yeah, can you I can give a little sense of what it took to go from putting the call out, you did some pre-reporting, you talked to people who ultimately didn't want to be included, but creating that level of trust between responding with an affirmative back to you that they might be wanting to, to chat about it, to building enough trust to not only get them to agree to be on the record, and sharing their stories, but sharing really harsh details of these stories? Yeah, um, I think providing them with as much information about the project as possible was very helpful. Um, they wanted to know where would it appear, um, if their names would be in it, um, um, what my angle, I guess, was for this story. Uh, providing that information and, and letting them know that it was a safe space. I'm going to treat their story with respect. I think those all lend a good hand in, in getting them to trust me and um, have me tell their story. That phrase, what's your angle, I think is something that all <laughs> of us can probably recognize. When they asked you about that in this particular case, what did you tell them? Oh, um, it's like it's hard thinking back on all this because I think about all the stuff that happened in 20. I started the story, I think, in February of 2020 before the world completely fell apart. <laughs> um, I I think I, I told them, uh, I think I probably had a bit of the title that I wanted for this article. And I uh, I let them know that I wanted to tell their stories in order to show that this is an issue. And then to also um, provide some solutions. And um, I wanted them to give me advice on what they thought brewery owners could do in order to create these safe spaces. So I wanted, I guess I took the angle of, I'm trying to give you a platform so that um, this doesn't happen to someone else um, and it doesn't happen to you again. I, so it sounds like um, for those of us here who might think about ways that we can approach asking people to have these kinds of conversations with us, that putting them in, putting the, the source, the person you're talking with in the driver's seat and really kind of letting them guide the conversation is what helped open that up, open that avenue up, but that also kind of helped them open up and talking to you as well. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to I want to share another example um, from one of uh, I think is Amanda's coworker if I remember correctly as I'm going to bring oh, this. Oh, Dania. Yeah, with mm -hmm. Dania. This quote just like this 
just kind of threw me on on my back when I when I read it, where she's talking about how she takes a car share um, when she's uh, away because or is she's afraid that someone will spot the work vehicle because it's so easy to find. Um, again, I, I realize that there's been some time since you've chatted with all of these women, but if we're thinking back when you're talking with her, do you recall what it took, if it did, in terms of kind of starting that conversation to getting to this just incredible anecdote? Yeah, I mean, I, Dania in particular was, uh, she was pretty open um, and just easy to talk to about those things. Uh, so I, I mean, I had a standard list of questions for each one and she also kind of like Amanda, I mean, they are friends. Um, just said it, said that part as if, you know, well, this is my life. Like it was, which is like heartbreaking because this woman is like, she says, I've probably spent a fortune on Uber and it's like, you shouldn't have to do that. I don't even know based on her tone. I don't even know if she understands how much of a, a stress that was putting on her that she didn't even realize. Um, and, and I got, I mean, there were a few women I talked to like that. They just, and like I said earlier, sometimes you don't realize how much you stray from this, the easy, straight point to point path in order to feel safe. Um, and it's just, it's just a part of being a woman. And, uh, yeah, I, it didn't really take much for her to say that, but yeah, reading it even now is just like, oh my gosh, is it, I don't wanna say is it worth it, but it's just tough. It's a tough thing to have to deal with. I, so um, I realized you had, you had mentioned about how, you know, the, the back and forth that you and I had in terms of talking about these interviews and the way that kind of brought to life uh, on the page as well. Um, one thing that I think we spoke about a little bit uh, that I think would be helpful for others too is talking about what this was like for you as a reporter. And you're hinting mm -hmm. at it here a little bit that mm -hmm. you are, you're receiving these heavy stories from people that have real weight to them. Yeah. What was it like for you as your responsibility to hold on to these stories and figure out a way to piece it all together. Yeah. Um, I, I keep thinking about Sarah, which she had the a hard, most difficult story um, to hear. Um, she, I remember talking to her I remember talking to her more than any of the other ones. Like I remember the room I was in and everything. And she um, she was a little uncomfortable about talking about it, but she was willing to talk about it. Cause she did, she had that mentality of like, I want people to know so that things can get better. And I listened to her, I remember listening to her story and she got a little, um, emotional and which made me I'm an emotional person made me emotional um but I you know held it together because I'm a professional and I remember it, I was at work on my lunch break and I closed my laptop went to lunch after our interview and I just like everyone at the table was laughing and I was just sitting there like I didn't know because that interview was still with me. And um, I remember making a comment about it, like, man, like I probably shouldn't have these kind of conversations in the middle of the day, or I don't know, something to that effect to my friends. And I don't think I even went into detail about what was going on, but I mean, it's tough, especially when you have, I think at that time in my life, we I was going through some personal stuff with a friend who had been assaulted and I had just found out about it. And, um, and that like was tough. That was really tough to hear and to deal with. And it's, 
I don't know. I go to therapy, so <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, and I mean, writing this article helped in a way too, because I felt like at least I'm trying to do something to help. Um, yeah. I, just, just as context for everybody, uh, Sarah Swenson in the story uh, shares a story of being uh, sexually assaulted. Um, by a coworker who you go on to point out, Stephanie, that they would run into each other at events. She considered her, or she considered him her friend. Yeah. And she drove, so she drove him home um, after an event, which, I mean, I've done that before. And it's just, yeah, her story just felt so it felt like one of those things where, dang, I've done stuff like that and that could happen, that could have happened to me. Um, it was so relatable. Did you know um, what she wanted to tell you when she said she would talk to you? Um, no, I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, but when she, like the way she paused and started talking around it before, um, she said it, I, I knew that it was something that was hard to hear. Um, yeah. Uh, whether for this interview specifically or others, do you recall what the cadence of that conversation was? You, you had said that you kind of had a list of questions that you knew you wanted to ask people, but from that point, everyone's story is gonna change and your follow-up questions and the way you talk to them will too. What was a typical cadence of an interview, say, from saying hello to getting to these kind of, you know, big revelations? Yeah, I wish I remember the questions I had. Um, but I rem the first, maybe, I, I think I probably have like five or six questions in total. The first few were very simple, like job title, um, um, kind of what they do now. Like it was just simple, like everyday regular questions. And then I, you know, like as a warm up to get them to start talking and us to kind of get to know each other a little bit. Um, and then I always felt myself pause when I, I, I had a question about like, can you tell me about a time when you felt unsafe? Um, at work or something to that effect. And I, I felt myself pause before, like almost bracing myself for whatever was going to come. Um, and I would say um, there would be a little pause. Some women asked for the questions um, ahead of time. So they kind of were ready. I remember Sarah, she, she asked for them ahead of time, um, which I think is good. I don't, usually do that but I mean if someone wants to and especially for this topic um just in case there's something they don't want to talk about and they don't want to have an inter interview um but yeah that part I think took a little longer um and based on the attitude of the woman if she felt just you know I'm trying to find the right word for this but if she just wanted to relay it as if it's, oh yeah, this thing happened to me. Um, of course, I mentioned Sarah, she was a little hesitant. Um, and I think that was mostly because it was just hard to say out loud. Because I remember at the time she told me she hadn't really told a lot of her friends or she had just started telling her friends about it. And it had happened a year or it a lot of time had passed. Um, and the other women, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, I think it slightly slowed down, like I said, because I started to brace myself for the responses. Um, and then also there was just a lot of detail. The women were comfortable with telling me about that particular situation. Um, so it did slow up a bit when we got around to that question. What did, um whether it was a Word doc or a notebook, what did it look like when you were having these conversations as you were trying to document the, the, what you were hearing? 
Um, I don't think I was taking notes at the time. I just, um, I would have, I would record the phone call and um, I would just listen. And I felt like that was the best way for me to be like completely present. And if I had, um, if they said something where I wanted to ask a, a follow-up question, I'd have like my notebook where I would write it down. Um, but I, I mean, I do that with a lot of interviews, which sometimes I feel like it bites me in the butt because then I forget what our conversation was, but I, I just listen and, um, and try to be as fully present as possible and give basically trying to give them that respect of um, letting them know I cared about what they had to say. What was it like listening to these interviews for a second time? <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't remember. Um, I would imagine it was as upsetting as it was the first time. I mean, like I said, Amanda's story stayed with me to the point where I didn't even have to refer back to the recording as much because I like knew every word. Um, and I, I think there was a few other, others like that. I mean, the stories just stuck out so much where um, I could write them without listening to the recordings again, but I did that. I did listen back for those quotes. Um, I don't, I, I'm looking at this article now on my second screen and I don't even know if I want to reread it because, um, yeah. I, um, is it okay, is it okay if I read a quote from it? Is yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, there was a quote from Nikki Johnson in which I specifically remember reading it in one of the drafts that you sent and I almost started crying. Um, Nikki Johnson, who is uh, a beer tender in Maryland, she was relaying a story to you about a patron who had waited long uh, toward closing. Uh, and it was unclear if he was actually going to leave or not and what mm -hmm. would have happened. Um, and her quote, as I read it, uh, is, I could scream as loud as I wanted and no one would hear it. Yep. Uh, uh, what is it like going back to that moment? Um, I remember, and I'm like, the feeling that I had then when I heard it is coming back now. I, that story pissed me off. Um, like the disrespect of this man. <laughs> and the fact that her, the brewery she worked at had her closing by herself I don't know if that's standard or not, but I mean, that's a ridiculous thing. I, yeah, I, I just, I was so, I was so upset. I was so upset because none of that had to happen. And, um, and I was frightened for her. Like it's, this is another one of those stories where it's, <laughs> it's, it's relatable. Um, you, I mean, you don't even have to be working in a brewery. You can just be walking to your car after being at a brewery for a while and, and, and someone's acting sketchy. It's, yeah, it's, it just pisses me off because it's just, there's just no, it just seems like there's no care or concern about her as a beer tender working late at night in an environment where there's alcohol and men and we know that men misbehave. Like, it's just, it's just, it, it, it's, I'm just, it just pisses me off. Uh, I appreciate you kind of reliving some of this process for the benefit of myself and others here. <laughs> I'm gonna ask a quick question, but um, if anybody has any questions, uh, I wanna encourage you to leave them in the chat box or chime in, I'll give you the opportunity. Uh, we'll chat for a few more minutes, and then if it's a question that you'd like to ask while we're not recording, that's totally fine. Um, Stephanie, this is uh, imperfect language, and I apologize for kind of the weird phrasing of this, but one of the, the, the parts of the conversation we had with Holly and Willie this past weekend was they were talking about in a similar thing that you're mentioning here, and you've mentioned uh, a few times now, is the relatability of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a straight white man. Uh, I cannot relate to these stories you were telling. 
Uh, I have told stories uh, like the ones that you were I, in course of my journalism career, um, which have taken a lot of trust building uh, in mm -hmm. time and effort. Uh, and a lot of that is listening as best I can because mm -hmm. I have no point of reference. Um, for those of us who might have a similar identity as mine, who are on this call and who may be listening, um, is there some amount of advice that you might offer us based on your, ex your experience telling these stories, listening and having these interviews on what worked effectively as a journalist that we might be able to consider when we're trying to tell these stories as well? Mm. Well, the first word that comes to mind is mansplain. <laughs> don't, don't mansplain to your uh, interviewee. Um, I, I would say some of the things that I've said before is like, make sure that you're listening, you're giving the respect um, they deserve. I mean, I would not question their experience. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, uh, tr try to take the side of the person who is, making them feel unsafe or harming them. Um, I mean, you don't even have to take their side, just listen. Um, if you have your own, your own personal feelings about it, you don't have to share them. But I, I will say for this, um, I, I try to empathize as much as possible um, and without, you know, putting my own self into it. But I, I think it it's almost, when you have someone on the phones crying with you, like you have to, you have to, I, I feel like you have to extend some type of warmth or comfort to that person um, to let them know that you care and you're not, you're listening, you're there, you care and you respect them. I, I think that just boils down like, um, yeah. Um, you had sought out the potential women to talk to through social media. Mm -hmm. When you, those things you're saying that you're there to listen and empathize and just kind of hear their stories. Do you remember what maybe, so they responded yes or no, potentially back to you, but do you remember what that, whether it was an email or a text or a phone call, like what maybe some of the things that you try to lay out before you even got on the phone with them, just to kind of try to build that initial block of trust? Um, yeah, so the, initially the conversations um, on Twitter, the DMs and uh, in the Facebook group, they were comfortable just commenting um, in the comments. And initially that, that first step was just getting their email. Um, and then through the email, that's when I went into a little bit more detail about the project. Um, excuse me, excuse me. Um, yeah, I went into more detail about the project there and was able to answer any, um, any questions they had. Some women wanted to get more details via DM. And I, I mean, I'm just like, I think that you should just meet people where they are. Like if that's what they want, if you prefer to have those conversations in email, but they are asking for them right then and there, like, I mean, give them the answers, um, be as accommodating as, as possible. Uh, I wanna open it up for any questions. If anybody has anything they'd like to ask, please feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. Brian, I'll unmute myself before my children interrupt. Um, I, Stephanie, thank you for being here. This is um, very, I have a hard time listening to this. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, I've been in the industry for a very long time. Um, I, I came up in the industry where you didn't talk about this. Yeah. Like it just wasn't a thing. So um, not to go off on a tangent about myself, but, and my friends experiences and stuff like that. But what I've found, um, did you, 
I feel like there's a lack of resources or support organizations or associations that are, we know this is a problem. Where can we direct people? Did you come across any like groups or legal advice or because there's so many organizations that don't have an HR department or the HR department is not even on their side. If they even have one, most of them don't. Um, but did, did anyone suggest like what they did? Did they just quit? Did they leave the industry? Did they report it to somebody? You know, anything like that, that would be valuable in directing people into a safe space moving forward? Um, no organizations I didn't come across. Um, and yeah, I, I know there are some in for general sexual harassment and abuse. Um, I didn't mention any of those in article, nothing beer specific. Uh, I actually just had a question about what I think that women what, what do I think needs to be put in place for women to feel safe? And you mentioned HR. Like HR could probably solve a lot of these issues. HR and culture, which I think you can take the culture from HR. And I'm thinking about, oh gosh, what was that? Uh, Boulevard, oh my gosh. Um, which is a whole nother conversation in the way they handled um, the harassment at their brewery. Uh, yeah, but no, I, I didn't come across any and, and I, that would have been really good to have, but I don't know if there's any beer specific ones. I mean, you said there, I feel like we're still not at a place where we're really talking about this stuff, um, which is so unfortunate. Um, but now I, you make me want to see if there's anything out there, um, cause that's definitely, I think something that needs to be created. But um, as far as what some of the women did, um, one really um, uh, urged women to call the police, um, call the non-emergency line if you're like walking to your car and you feel unsafe. Um, which as I say that as a black woman, I'm like, ah, that's not the first person I call, but <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that could work for whatever. Um, and in the other, I, I talked to some HR professionals and they were very big on culture and um, talking and, and, and finding, creating a culture where those things aren't allowed, but those, as far as resources, those were really the only ones. Does anybody else have any questions? Mm. I'm gonna ask one more myself and then I'll, uh, I will end the recording. So if anybody wants to chime in and talk more, uh, I would also welcome an open chat with our peers here. If anybody would like to talk Boulevard stuff, uh, Kate, I apologize for putting you in the spot. I know you're here, you covered the story, um, I can't, uh, tell if anybody else as well. But anyway, um, Stephanie, uh, I, I remember when you had sent in this pitch, you had writing experience. I don't think you had worked on a story like this before, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Um, how did this change you as a reporter and a journalist? Oh, man. Um. I, oh man, I would say I, I'm trying to find a way to put this into words. Um, so I will start by saying that I am not a trained journalist. I still call myself a writer, even though I do journalistic things. I, um, I like to tell stories and I think that I'm pretty good at storytelling. And this was, I think there is a story being told here, but I learned so much more about the, I guess the foundations of journalism. Um, and 
I mean, I know I still have a ton to ton more to learn about that kind of that aspect, but weaving a journalistic part of it in with the storytelling, like that's what I took away from from writing this piece. And again, Brian, I have to give you some props, but I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with me and help helping me guide and shape these things. I um, call Claire um, well, my uh, midwife. And so I will say you were also my midwife in getting the story out. And I just really appreciate your help with it. 